Welcome, welcome. Um, this is our Family History Digital Collection Discoveries program. And this is, of course, a virtual program. And we do have other virtual events that you can check out if you go to our website. And it's under Adult Virtual Events. And you can also sign up for our e-newsletter so you can stay up to date with everything that's happening at the library. Um, I just wanted to do some introductions. So if you have any questions during this presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat box. And Rachel is linking um, our class handout in the chat, as well as a few other links. Um, speaking of, let's do our introduction. So my name is Shanna, and I'm the South Carolina Room Supervisor. Um, as I mentioned just a minute ago, I've been in the South Carolina Room. It'll be five years this coming April. It's hard to believe. It's gone by really fast. I've had a lot of fun um, and really enjoy working in the South Carolina Room. And then we also have Rachel here today, and she's our Adult Outreach and Event Coordinator with the library system, and she's going to be helping kind of monitor the chat. So if you have any technical difficulties or anything or need the links to anything um, that I mentioned, just let us know and we'll try to get those for you. So I want to go ahead and get started because we have a big list of goals today that I hope that I get time to talk about. Um, so we're talking about the library's digital collection today, and we're going to talk about what exactly we include in the digital collection, as well as something that's called our Digitized Greenville Initiative that I'm really excited to share with you. We are also going to talk about how you can access the library's digital collection, and it's great because you, as long as you have an internet connection, you can access our materials in that collection from anywhere in the world. So that's really exciting. Um, we're also going to talk about different types of records that we have in the digital collection so that you can see how they might help with uh, family history research. And then I'm going to do a little demo of some of our collections. I won't, of course, be able to go through all of them, but I'm going to talk about a few that can be helpful for genealogy research. And we're going to talk about some search techniques. And then I'm going to talk about if you do find something in our collection that you would like to save and have a copy of or print out, I'm going to show you how to do that. And then lastly, if you would like to help us um, with our digital collection projects, I have a few ways that you can do that if you're interested. So what is the digital collection? So this is our historic image collection. And the library started what we call digitizing or scanning and making digital copies of our items around 2007. Um, we added what's called a digital asset management system in 2012. We started with Content Pro is what that was called. And that basically is the way that we make our materials, materials accessible and that we keep our materials organized. Um, you can see on this page, there is a image of the day book from the Alexander Macbeth store, which is a store ledger from 1794. And that was one of our first items digitized. We also believe that this is the oldest item in our collection that we have. So it was very important to get this material um, digitized. That's another way of helping to preserve this item, but also to make it accessible to everyone because with it being um, our oldest item, it is very fragile. So by digitizing, people are still able to read this day book and see what was going on in Greenville. What were people buying at this store? Who was shopping at this store? So very um, interesting book to take a look at and one that we wanted to get digitized. So that was one of the first ones that was done. Currently, we have really grown, especially in the past few years. We have around 25,786 items. That is a up-to-date total as of the first of this month. <laughs> and we are continually adding more to the digital collection. And we see this really growing in the next you know, few years, decades. Um, we just see it continually growing and growing and adding more. And so what kind of items do we have in our collection? Well, we have a, a wide range, actually. Um, we are focusing on genealogy and local history, specifically to Greenville, but we also do have materials for the surrounding upstate. Um, we originally, and even still today, 
we're digitizing and item adding items that were from our South Carolina room archive. So taking materials such as pamphlets or photographs or the Macbeth ledger that you saw on the previous slide and making sure those were preserved via digitization and adding those online. So materials that were within our own collection, that's um, some of the items that we were adding. But we also have received materials from schools, churches, and local organizations. Um, we've worked with like, for instance, the Greenville County Redevelopment Authority recently. So we have a collection of images of neighborhoods in the, the Greenville area. Um, we also have received materials from private collections. So family papers, like family collections. Um, one of the ones that comes to mind is the Woodside family. Um, so we have uh, different materials like that that can provide, you know, a wealth of information if you're doing family history research. And then also, of course, the local history aspect, because like this photo on this slide is of Main Street around 1914. So we have a wide variety of materials in our collection. And I mentioned before that I wanted to talk a little bit about our digitized Greenville initiative. And we have a link to that if you'd like to go on our website and see a little bit more about that. But one way that we continually build our collection of items is that we do ask for help from the community. And we reach out to the community um, either by doing scanning events where we'll go to branches and ask the community to come and if they have any photographs or documents, if they want to share them, they can come to a branch and we'll scan them and then return them to you before the end of the event. Um, we've also gone to like neighborhood associations and brought our mobile scanner and our digitization librarian has digitized photos from neighborhood associations. We've gone to churches. And sometimes people are able to bring their items and loan them to us. So if you have photos of the Greenville area or you have scrapbooks and things, you know, of the city or of a club or a school or a map, any types of those things we are very interested in and would love to take a look at and potentially add to our collection. And the great thing about this is because a lot of people do like to loan their items and then get them back. Um, you get to keep the originals, but you still are making the material accessible for a wider audience. Um, we do accept donations as well. Sometimes people are ready to find a new home for their materials and they can contact us and we can uh, take a look and see if they'd be a good fit for the collection and then they could be accessible the physical materials accessible at the library but also have those digital files um, accessible on our online site so that's something that we we are doing um, and you can sign up if you go to the link if you want to do a scanning session with our digitization librarian or you think you may have materials that might be a good fit. You can um, fill out that form and let us know um, and one other neat thing is that all the folks who do loan us items we uh, if they can provide a flash drive or hard drive we're happy to give digital file versions that we create to them, so they have another copy um, a digital copy of their items too. So one thing um, I think a lot of times when people think about our digital collection, they do think a lot about local history, which is true, but there's also a lot of resources in particular for family history that we have in our digital collection. So I just listed a few that came to mind here, but we have business records um, like that store ledger, for example, um, some things from mills and such. Uh, church records, like I mentioned, we've digitized some church archives and we have several materials from churches, clubs, a lot of people um, are interested in the history of clubs and then also if you're, you know, if you've done genealogy for a while, sometimes uh, when you are stuck and maybe you haven't been able to find a lot on an ancestor, one place you can look at is what kind of clubs were they in or what kind of, you know, churches as well or what were, you know, who were their neighbors and friends and things like that and, and what were they doing in their daily life. So clubs can be a great resource for family history. We also have a collection that I'm going to show you today that is includes coroner's reports. And I'll kind of explain once we get to that collection why it's significant. 
We also have another collection that I'm going to demonstrate today and show you how to search is our index of enslaved persons. Um, and that is for the upstate. And we do have several family books and family papers and, and letters and things like that from different families in the upstate. We have some military records in our collection. We have a news, some newspapers, and I'm going to show you one in particular today. And I'm also going to show you some yearbooks, which is what we have pictured on this slide is an image of one of our yearbooks for Sterling High School. All right, so the main portion of this class is I'm going to kind of demonstrate and walk you through our digital collection, and we're going to just practice some searching and kind of getting familiar with things. Um, and at the end, if you all have any questions, we can kind of unmute and we can talk about everything. Um, but I want to go ahead and get started because we have some cool things to look at. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop my slideshow. I'm going to open up our website. Now, if you have the handouts, um, you can also get to the digital collection by this link. We have this first option. This is a little bit hard to remember. I can never remember it, even though I see it all the time. Um, that's something we hope to eventually kind of customize our link so it's a little bit easier to remember. But right now, this is our, our web address. So this first option, if you click on it, it will take you to our digital collection page. So if you have this handout, keep it handy, you can do that. But option two is actually going through our website, which is most often how I do it. So you can go to greenvillelibrary.org, which is easy to remember. And then if you navigate over to learning and research section here, all you have to do from there is just go down to where you see historic image collection and click on that. And that will take you to the library's digital collection. So now that you're on this page, you'll see that we have um, 133 different collections. And on the first page, there's 30 collections displayed. And if you scroll down, you can see the rest. They're all um, listed alphabetically by the title of the collection. So you can definitely browse through by just kind of clicking and you know, this is page one and you can click on other pages to see the other um, collections on the other pages. But I did want to talk about how you can search um, and we'll do some browsing as well. But I wanted to talk about how you can search the digital collection. And my first example is I wanted to show you some of our yearbooks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the top here in this search bar, we're just going to do a basic search. There is this advanced search option that you can do as well. But for most of the things that we need, I find that the basic search usually works pretty, pretty well. And I'm just going to search by the search term yearbooks. And then you can either hit enter or you can do the magnifying glass if you're following along with me. But this will now show you the um, items that match the search term yearbooks that are in our collection. So right now we actually have a few different yearbooks available that are online. We have Sterling High, Welcome High School, Greer High, and Chikora College. So those are the ones we have right now, and we do hope to add more because we have a lot of um, the physical yearbooks in our archive, and we would love to get more of these online because yearbooks are one of our most popular collections that we have both in, in the library and on the digital collection. So now that you've seen this results here, we have 52 records that kind of came up that are matching that search term. We can actually refine this a bit. You have a few ways to do that so we can narrow down what we are looking at. So up here, it's the collections field. So right now it's showing all of the collections that we have. So it is searching yearbooks within every different type of collection. Um, we also have the subject. So you can see like Sterling High, and then we have some dates. You could refine by date if you were just looking for a specific date. And there's also this down here that's 
format, which I don't really use as often, but it's it will sort by different types of format, depending on if it's like a JPEG image or a PDF or something. Um, so what we could do is we could actually just say, let's uncheck select all, and you have to choose at least one. So let's say that we just wanted to look at Sterling High School. We could go down and we could just select Sterling High Yearbooks. And then all you have to do is click update. So what it'll do now is, don't know why that came up with a little error there, but luckily it loaded. <laughs> um, so right now we are looking at just the Sterling High School yearbooks. And right now everything is being sorted by the default is relevance. But I know a lot of times I like to do um, the dates. So what I you can do is, um, you can do like title ascending or descending. And since all of the dates are also in our title, it now puts them in order. So we start with 1945 and then we go to 1968. We are missing a few additions, but we have um, a good amount from 45 to 68. And so now if we wanted to select one to view, we can just choose whichever one we want to look at. And I think I'm going to look at 1959. So all I have to do is just click on that. And yearbooks can be a great resource for family history because, you know, a lot of times that might be um, a great place to find a photo of your ancestor or figure out exactly what types of maybe extracurriculars do they do? Were they in any clubs? Did they play any sports or anything like that? Were they a teacher, you know, also, you know, teacher or principal or something? They may have be in the yearbook for that. Um, so yearbooks can always be a really fun resource to to check. Um, one of the things when you see this page, this is kind of looking at just the 1959. This is the front cover, of course. And there's a few different ways that you can kind of go about viewing this. If you wanted to view this more of like an ebook type thing, if you just click on this view button here, it's going to pull it up into a screen that's going to look very similar to kind of like an e-reader, like ebook. And you have some controls where you can hit this button at the top. These arrows will go back and forth. So this just goes to the next page. One thing to keep in mind when we are digitizing these yearbooks is we do include every page, even if it's blank. So sometimes the yearbooks actually will include the signatures and things like that where people have signed. And so you have these little tools where you can go back and forth. Um, there's also a tool over here that will let you make this a full screen. This it will let you rotate it if for some reason it was, if you did need to rotate it for whatever reason, um, you can also zoom in and out as well with the plus and minus. So this is like, a, you can just, you could browse through a yearbook just like you were looking at a book. Um, another option, which I'll show you, is I'm just going to kind of exit out of this viewer right here. You can also see that there's a preview of each page. So they're in order, one, two, three, four, and, you know, we're on page, what would be page five. And you could kind of see a preview and go through and browse that way. If you say, hey, that, that looks like a page I want to view, but that can be a bit difficult. Um, especially if you're looking for either a specific person or maybe you're, you know, that you had an ancestor that was, let's say, played a certain sport or was in the band. You can actually search within the record by doing your search term here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now take out the yearbook term and I'm actually going to search for band. And then you can hit enter or click on the magnifier. And let's see what we have for the band. So one thing that's interesting is it always takes you to the page where the band is on. So this is, would be, um, and it's also within like the numbers since all of the pages are numbered. This is page 76, but it's also kind of showing you the, pre, the pages before page 76 and after. What I like to do, instead of showing all of the different pages, I like to click on filtered so that it only shows the pages where that term appears. So right now um, it went ahead and pulled this page up, but we can see that the band is down here at the bottom. So 
one thing that we can do now um, that might be helpful, it's especially helpful if you have a lot of text on the page, is most of our items have what is called a transcript, which is right over here. And this is something that staff or sometimes we have computer software that does optical character recognition or OCR, where it will try to uh, interpret what the text is. And um, that is another way that instead of staff just typing the text, that we can get text for the item. But this one is one that staff has typed um, out for this. And this is what allows us to search within this yearbook because we have the text is on every page, this transcript. So we can see that band is highlighted. And the reason we were able to find that is because this has been transcribed. So, so let's just kind of go down a little bit more and see more about this item. I just want to talk about how each object um, or, or item will have some what is called metadata, and it'll have some uh, some fields about it. Usually we have certain ones like title, creator, the date, and subject, and also copyright. So sometimes we get people who would like to have a copy of an image or use it for for something sometimes it's personal use sometimes we've even had people who want to use it for a book or something like that um so this tells you if there's any copyright so this one right now has no known copyright restrictions so that's always something to look for if you think you might be using it for something you know other than personal personal use and this is tells us that um the Greenville Cultural Exchange Center was actually the provider of this yearbook that allowed us to digitize it. And there's a few other informations about how we digitized it. We actually used a Book I4 scanner that's in the South Carolina room to do this, and it was uh, digitized in 2020. And this is telling about the specific item. So sometimes like if you have a picture of, you know, Main Street, it might tell you what streets are being shown or what year it might be. So that's always something to kind of take a look at if you want to know more about the specific image. And then I did want to show you that if you, um, let's say you wanted to search for a name of a person, like this page shows, it doesn't list all of the members of the band, but we have Willie Dover is listed as the director, so we could even search for Willie Dover and let's see if there's any results um, besides this page for Willie Dover. Just to kind of show you how you could search by a name. And so we have a couple of results. So here's one. Um, it looks like there's also a Willie Dover down here. So that's a way that you could search by name if you had an ancestor and you wanted to look through the yearbook. Um, let's say that we wanted to save this page, that this was one of our people that we were looking for, when we were researching and we wanted to save this page of the yearbook. We could go over here to this download button. It gives us the option to do a small, medium or large file size. So if you were wanting to maybe just email this image to someone, share like maybe you had a family reunion coming up or just wanted to share with another family member via email, you might choose like a small or medium size that's easily able to send via email. Um, if you were going to do like a printout or something, you'd want a larger size uh, to save for later. Or, you know, if you needed a more high, you know, quality image, you'd want to do the larger file size. We also have a print option. Um, this one you can only do by the item, but you could print this page if you wanted to as well. So that's just some of the ways that you could save and print. And you can try, if you wanted to go back, you could go back to um, Sterling High Yearbooks by clicking here, or if you'd like to search the whole collection of yearbooks, you could go to home um, and get back to the front page you could either browse or then search your books or by the school. You could say Greer High if you were searching for Greer High. But now I wanted to go on to coroner's reports because this is a very interesting collection. And I thought for this one that we could browse. So this one I, I know is on page two of our collection. So I'm just going to click on page two. And it's actually under Greenville County coroner reports. 
So I'm going to click on this one. And if you hover over, you'll notice that that gave me like a little description of what is in the collection. So I just clicked on the, the image of the book. So once again, we're taken to the front page and we could view this like a book by clicking this viewer again. If I scroll down, I can kind of see a little bit about this record set. Um, so this is a handwritten Greenville County coroner reports from February 1894 to December 1896. It includes inquisitions, testimonies, and verdicts. So why might this be a good collection for family history. So one reason is that death certificates in South Carolina were not a requirement until um, it didn't begin as a requirement until 1915. So you're not going to find death certificates until then. So this is actually predating that. So it might be, um, you know, even though it's just a small frame of years, this is a death, you know, a record of death that, you know, predates these death certificates. So, and it's for Greenville. So if you have a person who is an ancestor who may have, you know, lived and then died around, you know, around 1894 to 1896 in Greenville, this could be a great resource um, to check. And yes, I do realize that there's going to be a small amount of people who may have an ancestor in here, but they're also in this record are people who were interviewed that were not the deceased, but they were either a friend or a neighbor or a family member that they actually talk with. So that is another um, thing to check too. Even if your ancestor maybe did not die between 1894 and 1896, it's possible that they were interviewed for these coroner reports. So it'd be worth checking if you did have, if you think you have a family member that was in Greenville around this time. Um, and you, these are very interesting in and of themselves. Even if you maybe don't have an ancestor, they're very interesting to look through. They're very unique. It's something um, that is different from a lot of the other records that we have in the digital collection. But let's say that I was looking for a particular name, like I, let's say Simpson, like I had a lot of Simpson family relatives and I wanted to see if there were any Simpsons mentioned in this coroner report. We could do like we did on the other record is I can search the record and I can type in Simpson and then click search. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I like to do, like I said, the filtered search. So it's going to show me each page where there's results for Simpson and there's 49 results. Now this is an example of when the transcription that staff has done is really going to be helpful because you may be able to barely see this. Um, I can zoom in a little bit too, but this is very kind of faded, um, very light handwriting that's difficult to read. It's it's in cursive, so it can be a bit uh, difficult to interpret. But the good news is um, we have had staff who have already transcribed this. So one of the things that we can do is go back and look at the transcription. So here's the transcript for this page, and this is just a typed out version of what is on here above. So, I mean, occasionally, yes, there, there may be mistakes, um, especially if it was done by the OCR with the computer. I'll show you an example of that, but this can be very helpful. And this is also the reason why we're able to search by Simpson. So we can see some information here. I'm going to just kind of scroll through because this is about um, Emily Simpson who passed and we can see that they talked to her husband and that she passed, that she was sick, it looks like right before Christmas, um, and then passed away shortly after that. So it gives a lot of details about the um, about her death and talking to the people who knew her and last saw her. So like I said, these can be very um, interesting records to view. And then luckily we have the transcriptions of everything. So you can just keep clicking this little arrow to kind of go through. It's gonna highlight each 
word of Simpson that we are ha we have in the results. So if we keep clicking, it even goes down and highlights in this metadata that I showed you, it highlights that as well. So when you see the search results, it's also searching within the metadata and the transcription. So we'll see um, different places where that term appears that it has identified as a search result. But this is just talking about um, how the doctors went up and saw her. They it looks like they gave her some powders is what they refer it to. Um, and that she had not been in good health for 15 years and that she had had some tea and some other types of tea and things like that. So um, that, like I said, could be another resource if you're looking, if you're not able to find a death record for someone around this time frame. Um, you know, even if it's not just at our library, there may be other libraries that have digital collections. So definitely not just our digital collection, but check other libraries too. If you have ancestors from another county or state, um, check and see what they have because they may have similar types of records as these that can help you um, if you're not able to find a death record or if, you know, someone died before a state started requiring a death record. All right, so moving right along, I want to go ahead and go talk about one of our collections that's called the Index of Enslaved Persons. I'm just going to go back to home here. And for this one, I am going to browse again. Um, this is under Upstate, so it is going to be all the way at the end. And here we go. It's in our Upstate African American Genealogy Collection. And I wanted to talk about this collection in particular because it's something that we're continuing to work on. Uh, right now, we do have indexes of enslaved persons that are listed in probate records from Greenville, Lawrence, Pendleton slash Anderson, Pickens, and we recently added Spartanburg, and we're continuing to work on, um, we're working on Union, we're actually doing a second edition of Greenville as well. So I'll click on this Greenville one, um, this is the earlier version of it, we are working on adding a few additional fields to this to make it even a little bit better able to search and with a little bit more information. But I wanted to talk a little bit about this collection in particular, because it can be very difficult if you have African American ancestors to get past, um, you know, if prior to the 1870 census and 1850 and 1860 census, enslaved people were not listed on the census population schedule. So it can be um, difficult when you're trying to do family history research and looking at other resources can be helpful. And one of the resources that it can be helpful to consult are the probate records. So what this is, is an actual index of probate records. It doesn't contain the, the actual copies of the probate records. We have those on microfilm in the South Carolina room, but this tells you which apartment and file number where the probate uh, packet is located. So it is arranged, um, let me pull this up a little bit so you can see it better. So it is arranged by the uh, person whose estate was in probate, which is where the, the primary enslaver field, and it's done alphabetical. And then we have uh, the list on, of the enslaved person's name is over in this column. Now, keep in mind that the description is taken as directly transcribed from the historical record. So there's definitely terms that can be, you know, that are offensive and um, that the library doesn't endorse. But we are transcribing directly from the historical record in the description. And sometimes you'll even see girl or boy and that doesn't always mean that they were a young child sometimes those terms are used and that may not necessarily mean that they were um that were a young person but you can see um because uh the enslaved persons were treated as and considered property that in this time frame that's why they are appearing in the probate records and this is talking about the year of the record 
And like I said, this is where the record's located. So if you were to find um, an ancestor, like most times it's not listing the enslaved person's last name, unfortunately. Uh, so we have the, the first name. Sometimes there may not be a name. Um, but if you do find someone who is an ancestor and you want, we always suggest to also then go look at the probate packet itself. So you can go over here and say, okay, I want to see apartment one file 11 and you can come to the South Carolina room. And if you've never looked at our microfilm or looked at probate records, we can help you do that. And we can help pull out the microfilm and show you how to locate those records. Um, the good thing about the index here is that they are searchable. So we could do Alexander, for instance, we could search by a name, a first name, a last name, um, anything like that. And it will show you that there's 116 results that match just Alexander in these. And you could be, you know, more specific too. Um, and then we have the transcript as well, which is basically the same thing as above. The, these are easier to read, of course, because they're typed. But this also is nice because it highlights exactly where Alexander appears. And you can see in this record. So these can be um, very, very helpful, uh, if, especially if you are kind of at a, a brick wall. If you haven't consulted, uh, and you and you do have an ancestor who had been for you know been enslaved, that you could look at these uh, records for these upstate uh, probate records and see if there might be uh, someone in there that's a match for your ancestor. And once again, this is a downloadable index. And one thing about this one that's unique from the other ones that I showed you is you can choose to download just this page or you can download the entire uh, record. So you could download all, this is 160 pages. You could download all of this if you click that, that option. Um, so you can, you can do just the page that you are looking at now, but if you wanted to download the whole thing, you could as well and you could also print it. Okay, so now I wanna go back um, and talk about one more collection in particular that we have that's a pretty large and significant collection that we've recently digitized. So one collection that we recently digitized is called the Greenville Piedmont, which is the evening edition of the Greenville News. So let's get to that page. I'm going to browse there. You could search it, but I'm just going to hit page two. And so what we can do, and you may notice like if you're viewing with me at home, that at home, you will only see the Greenville Piedmont and you will not see Greenville Piedmont continued. And the reason for that is the Greenville Piedmont here, this collection are all the editions that we have of the Piedmont that are in the public domain, which means that they are um, 1926 and before. So due to copyright, they are able, we are able to put them online because they are now in the public domain. The ones in this collection, the Greenville Piedmont continued, are the ones after 1926. So for those, you actually have to be in the library to view them because they are not in the public domain, but you can go to any of our branch locations and navigate to our digital collection, and then you would be able to view the rest of the Greenville Piedmont. And we are actively digitizing our right microfilm for this collection of papers. We are the only place as of right now that has a digitized version of this paper. So it's a very important collection. Um, even though it's the evening edition of the Greenville News, there oftentimes were things printed in the Piedmont that were not included in the morning edition. And so I'm gonna click on the Piedmont and just kind of show you what I mean. So when you click on this, you're gonna see results for all of the Piedmonts from 1912 to 1926 that we have digitized. So one way to um, kind of sort that is you could go over here and choose within the dates listed, or you can do the, the uh, title ascending or descending. So let's say I wanted to start with the 1926, I might say descending 
And that would start me at 1926. So December 31st, and then I could work my way up. Or if you'd rather start with 1912, you could do that. You can also search within this collection. So if you go up to the top and you wanted to only search the 1912 to 26 Greenville Piedmont papers, you could ser search by an ancestor's name and you could do that up here. And then it would let you know out of the papers here if there's any matches. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to search her specific term, but I'm just going to click on this first one here so we can kind of pull up the paper and look at it. I want to talk about some interesting things with this collection, what you may find in here if you are doing family history research, but also some challenges with this collection. So we have, you know, the front page of the Piedmont here. You could always click on view so that you can get those zooming in and out tools. That's going to be helpful here because it is a little bit difficult to read if you don't zoom in. You'll notice as it's loading, um, a computer did the OCR for this paper. So when it's loading, you kind of see the text that was um, recognized by the computer. But this is from December 31st, 1926 for the Greenville Piedmont. And you can, like I said, you can zoom in. Um, you can scroll up and down and kind of look at the different articles. So you have a lot of local news, of course, but you also have some news from around the country as well. Um, the papers can be very helpful for family history research because there can be information about uh, someone who has, you know, that died or someone who, you know, an ancestor who got married or even social functions and, and things like that you can see in the paper, like society. Um, so you can see on this page, we have some information about some deaths that weren't from Greenville. They were around the country, but we also have some that, um, looks like, you know, we have some information about a Pelzer man. There's an article about Pelzer man. There's, uh, some people like this is a person that was, uh, from Georgia who had died. So even if you, um, maybe even if you don't have a, an ancestor from Greenville, but you have someone that lived in, you know, adjacent states or surrounding area, you never know that they might be in this paper. Um, or if you haven't, you know, sometimes we've even seen that an obituary that was published in the Greenville News in the morning edition, maybe had a expanded version of the obituary in the afternoon slash evening paper of the Piedmont. So if you have um, an ancestor, you've already located an obituary in the morning edition of the Greenville News, then you might want to check the evening edition as well, just to see if there's anything different. Sometimes there will even be photographs um, in the Piedmont. We actually were contacted by a researcher a while back for someone who um, had perished at Pearl Harbor and they were an upstate person and that lived in the ups. I think it was, it might've been Greenville. I think it was actually Greenville and they were looking for a photograph and um, we were able to find mention of the death in the morning edition of the Greenville news, but it was, there was no photo, but then one of our staff looked in the Piedmont and they actually found a photo there with the obituary. So that's just another way just to think about newspapers, you know, are being a great resource for family history. And then how we have this resource here that's not available anywhere else at the moment. So definitely check it, check this out. That being said, there are a few limitations <laughs> to searching this. Um, like I mentioned before that we had a the computer, we actually outsourced this to a company who digitized it for us and they used a computer that did OCR and it created a transcript that is able to be searched. But if you look here, you'll notice that there's quite a bit of, of what looks like gibberish. There's a lot of things that look fine, but because it's a computer, some of it has to do with the quality of the original microfilm scan. And there's some creases here and some things it's just a little bit harder for the computer to translate into text. So what you'll see is there are some gibberish and some things like special characters that are not actually in the paper. Um, so that's something to keep in mind 
that you can you can search, but it might not pull up everything. So you may have to also browse the editions. But one example is if I type in Columbia, because I do see an article that mentions Columbia, and I click search, it does recognize that. And if I go down to the transcript here, you'll see that it highlighted Columbia but it's Columbia votes. And on here it said Columbia Yotes. <laughs> so it just made an error by interpreting the um, V as a Y. So that's very common. So one thing that we are trying to do, and this is where I wanted to talk about if you'd like to help us out or you're interested in volunteering, we have um, a way to correct this and we have volunteers that help us with this. So I want to go next to talk a little bit about that. So I'm going to go back over here real quick to our handout. And at the bottom of your handout, so this handout is just kind of walking you through some of the things that I've talked about of how you can search our digital collection and how you can filter and do some of the search tips that I mentioned. But if you go down um, to the bottom here, there's also ways to get involved. So I mentioned Digitize Greenville. But now the last thing I wanted to kind of talk about before I leave you today is our transcription projects. So if you go to from the page, which is linked down here, and I think um, we also added that in the chat, but really quickly, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about from the page. So from the page is a software that we use and anyone that would like to help do transcription projects and just help us make our items more searchable, they um, can go on our page here for the SC room and they can find a project and get started. So we actually have the Greenville Piedmont on here. So if you click on it, you can see that um, some of the editions have been transcribed to a certain point and some of them have not been started yet. So if you would like to help, you can choose an edition of the Piedmont or you can choose one of our other projects that we have available and you can go and you can see that in this particular edition, none of the pages have been transcribed yet. And what we're doing here is um, with the OCR being kind of a little bit of gibber, gibberish that I showed you. Um, you can, you do have to kind of say that you aren't, you know, confirm you're not a robot. <laughs> um, let's see. And then you can transcribe as a guest or you can even just sign up if you'd like. So I'm going to say do it as a guest, but you can start transcribing the paper and typing. And what we do is we do have instructions it's on how to get started. And then if you have any questions, you can write a question down here and staff can look it over and review. Um, you can even mark that it needs to be reviewed and staff will look over it and answer your questions. Um, let me show you one that's actually been started so you can see an example. Okay, this is one that someone has already done. So we've had a volunteer come through here and they have typed up the entire uh, page of this paper so that it's now been transcribed. And what we will do is we will import this transcription back up into our digital collection once it's complete. And then our this edition of the paper will be able to be way more easily searchable than the computer gibberish OCR that we encountered that I showed you. So if you would like to do that, um, we do have a link and you can volunteer and help us with those projects. And we would greatly appreciate any help. And that's kind of just helping make uh, history more accessible and family history as well. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. I'm going to get back to my slideshow real quick. So this is just about from the page here. Um, always like to kind of conclude with saying that we'd love for you to come visit the South Carolina room, because even though this is about our digital collection and we're happy to have this collection accessible all around the world, um, we also love it when people come visit. 
and you don't have to make an appointment. You can just stop by, but if you would like, um, we do recommend appointments if you would like us to pull materials beforehand so that we can get prepared for you and that you can make the most of your time. We also do online record requests for certain types of records, including news articles and things like that and obituaries. So if you're um, not in Greenville or are unable to get the South Carolina room, we can still do some requests remotely. And we have a lot of different resources in the room. We have maps and like I mentioned, the microfilm, if you're interested in seeing probate records or even looking at our microfilm of the Greenville News or other newspapers, we'd be happy to show you how to do that if you visit us. All right, so that kind of concludes um, our talk for the day about the digital collection. There's a lot of collections that could be used for family history research that I did not discuss today. I just wanted to talk about a few that are kind of unique to us and that could be used um, for family history research, but there's a lot of other ones in the collection as well. Like I mentioned that we have some military records, such we have the United Spanish War Veterans Ledger. We have some other business ledgers and things like that and photographs for different families. We also have some eBooks for families. So be sure to kind of look through um, more of the collection and search and practice all those things. And then, of course, if you have questions, you can definitely reach out to us. And if you have questions now that um, you had during the class, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the chat. And you can either unmute or, or I can just look through and read the chat. So let's see. I do have a question in the chat. And let's see, Melinda said, when did papers begin the obituary pages? So that's a great question. You'll notice a lot of those um, earlier editions of the paper, they did not have like a set obituary section. They would be all throughout the paper that they would mention a death or sometimes it could even be almost more of like a news article. We also have sometimes um, what would be kind of considered a funeral article or a funeral notice back then it would be more about the actual funeral than the death itself or like what we would see as a traditional obituary. So um, those earlier editions, especially like early 1900s, that you're not really going to see like a section labeled as obituary. That didn't really happen till later on. Um, one thing I can show you is if you go to our website, we have under that learning and research, we have obituaries and staff have actually um, indexed obituaries from the Greenville News. That's not the Piedmont that I showed you, but we have the Greenville News from 1901 to present. And one thing that you can look for is record type. Uh, and you can see all the different ones. So like the funeral articles and the funeral notices, those tend to be um, earlier on. Sometimes you will still have funeral articles later, but you can see like a lot of these earlier ones that we have from 1903 and 1904, we have more funeral articles. And then we have funeral notice as a category. A death notice is usually just a very brief, name of the person and that they died it doesn't really give like that biographical information that we are kind of seeing more so in the obituary and it just depends on the paper on on when they kind of had a dedicated section for that but that's a great question All right does anybody else have a question Well, if you want to, if you're thinking of one, um, you can type it in the chat or unmute. And I'm just going to go ahead and do a couple more announcements before we leave. And then I'll check the box one more time before we close. But wanted to mention that, first of all, thank you so much for joining and for um, listening to me <laughs> share about our digital collection. Very excited about our digital collection. And we hope to, like I said, just continuing adding to continue add more materials to this and making these materials accessible to everyone. Um, so I really thank you for letting me share about it. 
And then in May, I'll be doing another class and that'll be actually pertaining to vital records. So we will be talking about obituaries and birth records and marriage records. And we are going to be specifically talking about Greenville and South Carolina in specific, but um, it can also be helpful too, because I'll share a few tips on if you're not uh, just looking at Greenville or South Carolina, but that's going to be the focus of the class. So if you'd like to register, you can go ahead and click on the link that Rachel has shared in the chat. We'd love to have you there. Um, so that's going to be May 25th from four to five, and that's going to be over Zoom again. All right. And then the last thing is I always like to just mention that if you aren't already, please follow us on our social media pages. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, so we have, this will be recorded and added to the YouTube channel. We also have a lot of our other family history videos that we've done. We've done classes on how to use ancestry.com and newspapers.com and some of our other databases, as well as a variety of local history topics as well. So if you um, go to our, our YouTube channel, Greenville County Library on YouTube, there's a local history and genealogy playlist. If you have any questions, you can always email ask a library, ask librarian at greenvillelibrary.org as well. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So thank you so much. Um, and I'll hang out for just another minute or so. But I hope to see you at the next event. Thank you.